Christ Community Church, located at 25th and Thomas Avenue in Portsmouth, Ohio. Not many, many Pearl fans here, are there? When she says, howdy, yeah, she would. this is going to be a hard sell this morning. Before I start on our text, that's really from the 53rd chapter of the book of Psalms, um, there's some puny people I want to take just a minute and talk about. And to, rem and to kind of let you know that on May the 6th and 7th, that weekend, it'll all be about our recent uh, adventures in Africa. We've got tons of pictures. Patrick and Eddie will be live on the overhead. And, and, uh, and so we'll have an, uh, an interesting uh, session both on Saturday, it'll, Saturday night and Sunday morning will be essentially the same to let you know about that. And it would be a wonderful time for you to invite guests to come with you. It, it would be something they would really enjoy because there'll be no preaching. Now then, let, let me talk about a few puny people. Uh, Dave Literal is here somewhere back here about half asleep, but he's been in, he was in the hospital early this week. And, uh, and I, I want to use him as a illustration of something we need to mention to those of you who are 60 years old and older. David was found, he kind of conked out and was laying in his yard and the neighbors called the squad and they brought him to the hospital. And mostly what was wrong, even though he thinks he's probably dying of consumption or some other thing, but the truth of the matter is, he, like so many of the rest of us, are, is, is worse than poor, just plain awful at staying fully hydrated. Now listen to me carefully. Anymore when you go to a doctor, if you're drawing Social Security, they're going to ask you, almost the first question they'll ask you is, have you fallen lately? Because falls are the biggest problem that older people have, really. And one of the major reasons that they fall, my doctor recently sat me down and, and just gave me a lecture. He said, look, there are two reasons why you fall. And this is universally true. One is... You just are not properly hydrated. You don't drink enough water in particular. Number two is you move too quickly at times. And when you move too quickly, sometimes your head doesn't have time to keep up with your actions, and you'll just go down. And so he said, learn to, to, to govern your behavior and to make sure that you're sufficiently uh, disciplined to drink enough fluids on a daily basis. Because when you fall, so often we break a hip, you go to the hospital, you lay in bed, you get pneumonia, and then you die. And it's not a real good way to go. I mean, there's a better way to do it than that. You know, I'm not certain just what it is yet. I haven't figured it out yet. But whatever the better way to go is, is I'm signing up for that rather than falling, breaking a hip, 
da 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 da. Now, and I, I use David as an illustration because he picks on me all the time. And then there's two or three other people that I need to mention. Suzanne Welsh is usually here on Saturday night, but she's she's had a, and if you have if you you've got their their addresses here, it would be wonderful if you would take the time to send them a little note. Um, she's had uh, some heart problems and and she's back home, but she's not well, and uh, she's been so faithful here, and and she's one of those people that that. Uh, a register high on the list of favored personnel for preachers. She sends her tithe every week. She sends her tithe every week. Okay. Uh, I was talking to Jean Tapman just for a minute this morning. Janet's not doing well at all, and they found another spot, uh, and she's struggled with cancer for some time, and, and she isn't doing well. She's in the hospital, so please keep her in your prayers. Uh, Ron Powell is recovering. There's some others who you can read for yourself. But it, this week, and I don't know the details on this, but it, it is it's, it's, it's serious because of some other things. A couple that, that attend here on Saturday night, um, their daughters, uh, their their granddaughter, was taken to Children's Hospital this past week with a problem and. Uh, and I don't know all the details. But some time ago, uh, their son, which would be the uncle of the little baby, uh, died there at that hospital. He had hung himself, and uh, it was, uh, I don't think he was trying to commit suicide. I think it's some teenage silliness that goes on at times. And now they're back there with the grandbaby. And uh, th those things pile up on people. And just to be able to drive back there where their son died was a, a tough road to hold. And, and you, you just need to remember that people like that, uh, they need a word of encouragement, a pat on the back, and, and, and to know that they're being prayed for and encouraged is important. And, uh, I, and I can't remember their name right now. What's her name, Alice Kay? Do you remember? Kirkendall. That, you're not Alice Kay. <laughs> Thanks, Kayla. Okay. And the little girl's name? Mallory. Mallory. Mallory Kirkendall. Okay. You got it there. You do come in handy at times, don't you? Yeah, thanks. All right. That being said, let's look at, at, at the text there in the, 51st, uh, in the 51st Psalm. The background of this psalm is... Um, is what had happened to David recently in his life. As Matt pointed out last week, he had gotten to the place where his general said to, the, to him, David, the day is no longer, it no longer exists when you should lead us into battle. We need you safe at home to run the country. You stay here. David's still a fairly young man, a virile young man, and now he had too much time on his hands. It was Benjamin Franklin who wrote in Poor Richard's Almanac that uh, idle hands are the devil's playthings. I, when I grew up, that same saying was said a, a little bit differently. It was idle hands are the devil's workshop was the that we were taught in growing up, but it's all the same difference. David had too much time on his hands. And uh, even though he kept the word of God, the Bible says he kept the law of God before him day and night. He kept God's will before him. As a young man, Samuel poured some oil on his head. And from that time on, the Bible says that he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, this creates an interesting thing here. We have the man of God with a lot of extra hand time on his hands. And he's sitting around and, and he sees this beautiful young woman bathing on the rooftop and he begins to lust after her. And I guarantee you she was taking a bath more than once. These kind of things build over a period of time. 
and in his mind then. So here we have a man who is, the Spirit of God is in him. But nonetheless, within the men and women of God, we still have within us the natural desires of the flesh. They're there. And the only person that ever lived totally beyond those temptations was Jesus himself. We all have them. I'll be honest with you, I've always tried to be. I'm uh, just real straightforward about these kind of things. I believe that all healthy, normal men are tempted at one time or another with lust. And I'm talking about lust after somebody other than their wife. All of a sudden, it's awfully quiet. That's a struggle that men have. See a beautiful young woman time and time again, especially when you get old and you know when you look in the mirror, there ain't much to look at anymore. And, and th those, those lusts are still there. And the mind goes off to the Holiday Inn or the no -tell Motel, and there's all kinds of things that happen in the minds and hearts of men. I've never been a woman. I have no desire to be. But I strongly suspect that they struggle with the same thing with some good-looking dudes like us. And so it's easy to sit back, and it is easy to sit back and point fingers at things, at people that, where we've never been caught and we've never confessed. Because you see, the Lord doesn't just judge actions. The Lord looks upon the heart. And in the heart of all of us at one time or another, we have done the same thing that others have got caught doing. We need to understand that that struggle exists and is universal. And then we need to be able to talk about it and see how to fix it or at least improve on it. The early church was described both in scripture and in classical histories as those who conducted themselves who were beyond reproach hardly ever was there an immoral accusation made against them. You and I live in a day when moral accusations or moral immoral behavior is not only common, it's accepted as though it weren't wrong. I personally believe that, uh, well, I was in a meeting in, in uh, Louisville this recently with three or four other ministers doing our little senior minister's podcast. And, uh, and Bob Russell, one of the guys that retired from the large church there in Louisville, about 25,000 people show up on a weekend, and their, and their, their weekly income is in excess of a million dollars. I tried to make a deal with him back several years ago. I said, Bob, I, 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 listen, I'll make a deal with you. If you will give us one week of your income, We'll give you hours for a year. And that tightwad would not accept that. I thought it was a reasonable offer to, for him to be generous and helpful. And uh, I've forgiven him, but not without some hassle. It's, it was, he's done a tremendous work there. The other guy, that, Don Wilson, has a church of similar size in Phoenix, Arizona. And the other guy is a, is a retired or president of a Bible college in Joplin, Missouri. Plus, he served a pretty good-sized church down in southwest Indiana. We were talking about this very thing. And what Bob brought up was this. The number of high-profile ministers who have had the same problem. I mean high-profile the president of the National Association of Evangelicals had a large church there in Colorado. 
Same problem. I can honestly say that I have never been involved sexually with anyone other than my wife. But I've looked and lusted at some pretty good looking babes through the years. And I don't trust any man who won't admit that he's done the same thing. Thankfully, it didn't go any further than just the thought. But we need to be able to talk about those things if we're going to do anything to address the problem and see if we can get better at it. David saw this younger woman beautiful and he lusted after her and then committed adultery and she was impregnated and in order to cover his sin he ultimately had her husband assassinated and then they were married but the penalty for it was awful the penalty for it was awful David had a great preacher. His name was Nathan. They called him a prophet, but a prophet and a preacher is all the same difference in the Bible. Nathan confronted David, and remember this now, because here's where, Nathan, here's where the preacher's coming from. He knew that the word of God said that to whom much is given, much is required. David had much. And so more was expected of him than Joe Blow down in, uh, down in uh, some little city on the, in the desert. From the time that he was just a youngster and was anointed by Samuel, he had his body as the recipient of the presence of the Spirit of God. He had before him the word of God. As a warrior, he never lost because God saw to it that he was constantly victorious. To whom much is given, much is required. I personally think the same thing is true for those of us who are in positions of leadership in the church. I think I can prove from Scripture that the penalty for sin for those of us who have been blessed beyond measure is a little tougher than probably for all the rest of you. But no one gets off the hook. Even though God said immediately to David, I've forgiven you for what you've done, but you still must pay for what you did. For whatever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And he said, David, as a result of what you've done, your family from now on will be a source of a war. Your family, you're going to be fighting within your family. And the result was Absalom, who David, had, he was one of David's kids, that David had picked to be his successor actually led a revolt against his dad and ultimately he was killed by one of the generals. David wept over Absalom. He was the one who had hair. I didn't like him very well either. So, and he said not only that, but remember to whom much is given. You have secretly slept with another man's wife and now other men will sleep with your wives only not in secret it'll be out before everybody the penalty for sin in this life is tough and serious and here's the thing that makes it heartbreaking 
The Bible says that when we sin against God, and I call these two great sins. And the reason I call them great sins, and, and, and the Bible doesn't say it that way. I'm saying that. The reason that I call them two great sins is because they broke two of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not murder. Six and seven of the commandments he violated. Those were the commandments that he kept before him day and night. He had no excuse. He knew better. But you see, when you, the devil knows exactly where to attack us. He had all kinds of time on his hands. He had a fast zipper anyway. The devil knew that. That's where he attacked him. The preacher that David had came to him under God's authority and said to them, David, I want to tell you a story. And he told him a little parable about a man who had one sheep and another guy who had a whole field full. He said, the guy with the whole field full took the one from the other guy. What should we do with him? David was not very sharp. He didn't catch and he said, the guy should be severely dealt with. Nathan put his old boiny finger right up David's nose and said, David, you're the guy that did it. Now, David had three different options at that time. He could do what most people do, deny, deny, deny. Deny and, and probably could have gotten away with it. Probably. If it hadn't been for the cockeyed preacher. Can you imagine if one of you were in an adulterous relationship? If I came to your house and stuck my nose up your finger and accused you? I would probably get shot. David's no different. But what he did... You know, he, the second option, really, that was uh, all, all open to him, that wouldn't be open to us, is that he could have killed Nathan on the spot. Because the surrounding nations, the kings of the surrounding nations, would have done just that. They would have killed the accuser. Problem goes away. But David it didn't do that. He admitted his sin. And then he did something. He, it said, the Bible says that then he went into seclusion where just he and God could talk. And there's something to be learned here. Be care, he, he went there for the purpose of confessing and, and, and trying to reestablish his relationship with God other than, other than that of just being a guilty sinner who was in the process of being punished. In the privacy of his prayer closet, and all of us need a prayer closet, because there's some things, folks, that you only confess to God. Because most people can't be trusted. They can't. So David goes in there, and he says to, to the Lord, Lord, I was born from sinful parents. And I've had this problem from the day I was conceived. And I've sinned against you, God, and only against you. Now that sounds funny because he actually sinned against Uriah when he slept with his wife. And then he murdered Uriah, or had him murdered. So often the cover-up is worse, or at least is bad. In this case, it was probably even worse than the sin itself. The Bible says, in the, when you go to the fifth chapter of the book of James in the New Testament, it says that we're to confess our faults one to another and to pray for one another. 
and it adds so that you might be healed and that that's both physical and spiritual healing confession cleanses the soul and so we need to make those confessions because I don't think repentance takes place until we have honestly confessed what we've done but we need to understand what our purpose in life is. And David let that slip. You see, we have choices all the time. Do we have, are we choosing to please God or are we choosing to please ourselves? We're born, I get this, and David actually says this, surely I was sinful at birth. Well, I doubt that, but I think all of us, the Bible, the Bible teaches that all of us have a propensity for sin. See, I don't believe that flesh itself is sinful. And God doesn't judge just the flesh. The Lord looks upon the heart. Now, when he talks about the heart, he's not talking about the pump in your chest. The Bible talks about the heart. If you do your research, you'll find that there are four things in the Bible where the word heart is used in reference to the innermost thoughts and being of a human being. Sometimes it's talking about the intellect, your mind. Because the ultimate desire of God is that when we're converted to Christ, that the thoughts that we have ultimately are replaced with the thoughts of Christ. For me, to, the Apostle Paul said that the mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Now that doesn't happen overnight. It happens over a period of time as we study the Word, as we get encouragement from other people, and as we make the commitment for my life to reflect who Jesus is. And without that commitment, we don't get very far. See, we make commitments all the time. We make a commitment to get a new car. We make a commitment to educate our children. We make a commitment to, to, to have a nice house. We make all of those commitments. And then we use our energy to achieve them. But as Christians, our primary commitment is to develop a life that pleases God. And we probably need to repeat that commitment, if you've made it. <coughs> Excuse me. We probably need to repeat that commitment every morning of our life. Because we are all are so easily distracted. We are. And we need to realize that in each other. So confession to each other is probably helpful. But be real careful who you confess things to that can divide and destroy your family or that can divide and destroy the church, which is really your family anyway. I've often thought of how wonderful if it would be if we could find some way to restore what took place in the early church. Because what, you know, they, Paul would plant a church, say, in Ephesus or Colossae or Corinth, one of those towns, and you think about the church. They had no church building. They met in people's homes, and there probably were, in most cases, were half a dozen people, maybe a dozen. But that was a church plant. And they would come together probably on a Saturday night because they were, uh, that was the beginning of the Sabbath. The Sabbath went from sundown on Friday evening to sundown on Saturday. The, the first day of the week started uh, on Saturday evening. That's why we justify Saturday evening church service. We'd probably think of another reason if that wasn't there, but that's the reason, the one we use anyway. But what they would do, that they would, they'd have a little carry-in supper. And they would sit there, and, and if somebody could read, they would take one of the letters that the Apostle Paul had written and, and read that letter. Because many of them couldn't read and write. 
They would share their supper together, and after they were done, they would take a cup of wine and some bread and break it apart. Because, you see, communion is really like, for them, like television is for us today. It was a teaching tool that helped us to understand what Jesus did on the cross. It's just like baptism. Baptism is essentially a teaching tool to help us to understand that the person that we were there, that we were before we commit, before we accepted Christ, is dead and buried. He's a goner. And then when we come up out of the water, what's the first thing that we do? We breathe. Do you know what the word for 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 spirit in the Bible is? Breath. And so the image there that, that, that the Bible teaches through the, that simple of bearing in the water and coming up and the taking of that breath is the incoming of the Spirit of God as God breathes His presence into our life. See, it's a teaching tool to help us understand who we are in Christ Jesus. That's the reason I don't sprinkle people. You'd have to sprinkle for a long time to get them buried. So that's supposed to be funny, but that's all right. Did you laugh? You get a raise. Now the problem we have as believers is admitting our weaknesses to each other. And we, see, you can admit your weaknesses without going into the details of sin. Because we all have them. And the two areas where we're the most vulnerable, at least in our culture, deals with money and sex. They're the most aggravating. And see, sex is such a beautiful thing when it's done as God laid it out for us. You see, God's greatest thing that we know about is his capacity to create life. And sex carried out under the guidance of God is we get to do the same thing. That's magnificent. Then the money thing, and in our culture, and I suppose it's probably everywhere, is we get the idea somewhere along the line that the money we have is ours. It ain't. No, it isn't ours. The Bible says that we are to be stewards over God's stuff. It's his. And we're to, we're to do And so I have people... I have people, I'm, I'm, some of them are Bible college educated, and I think, what in the world did they not teach them? And I've had them to say, you know, uh, uh, I, I, I send my tithe. And I, I said to this one girl, she's got a, a good job, and I said, and she was telling me that she had sent her tithe. I said, but none of my business, but how much do you send? And she said, uh, whatever the number was. I said, well, that ain't a tithe. I know what you make. She said, what do you mean that's not? Hey, the word tithe means 10%. You make a contribution, and there's a difference between a contribution and a tithe. You made a contribution, but you didn't tithe. You know what? If all of us were to tithe, we'd have a hard time finding what to do with the money. Did you, you realize that? And the churches that have really prospered through the years are like the one at Southeast. They had the money to do magnificent things. Before the church split here, we were, we were probably a little ahead of them in some ways because Bob copied off us sometimes and didn't give us the credit. But money and sex, money and sex, if we used both to please God, consciously made the commitment, I'm going to use this to please God, our testimony to the world would be a lot stronger than it is now. Because those are the two areas where the pagan world judges us the most harshly. They do. Now, great men, and greatness for me means those who make a great impact for God. I watched a thing on television this morning. I don't know whether you saw it or not, but if you get a chance, you ought to watch it. It was a kind of a, a thing on the life of Charles Stanley. It was really well done. 
because he was truly a great man. He really, really was. He was a tough hombre, too. He was like Nathan. Nathan, you know, Nathan had the guts to stick his finger in the king's nose and say, you're the guy. You're the sinner. But you may not know, and I heard Andy tell this, so I know it's the truth, and his daddy admitted it because his dad was standing there. He had been called to the pastor at, at First Baptist Church in, in Atlanta, Georgia. And he'd been there probably six months, and he was in a struggle with the deacons over who was going to run the church. This really did happen. At a congregational meeting, he and the chairman of the deacons got into a fist fight. And the preacher won. So don't, I, all you got to do is look at Alice K's forehead and you know how a tough hombre I am. You know, there's 11 stitches up there. I didn't have anything to do with it, but I'm taking credit for it. But, but one of the things that I've always appreciated about Charles Stanley and people like him, they have been quick to admit their flaws. And I learned a long time ago, all of us preachers are going to, we all have flaws. And whenever we stump our toe, and sooner or later you will, the first thing you want to do is to tell the church. And then when the rest of the town finds out about it, you can say, yeah, he told us. And it's over. It's a, it's a good practice for everybody. You know, I could go on here for a long time with some really juicy stuff, but I'm not going to. I'll just tell you, one of the probably, let me see what time it is. Yeah, I've got 15 minutes. Now hang on to this because this is kind of interesting. You can wake up to this. Probably the most influential theologian maybe in the history of the church and, and especially right now in our history, believe it or not, is Augustine. Oh, the theologians now call him Augustine, but his name was Augustine. Augustine grew up in northwestern Egypt in a town, in a city called Alexandria. Alexandria was the was at that time in his in about the fourth century between the four was the leading theological center on the face of the earth. It had the largest library in the ancient world. People traveled from India, Pakistan, all over the Far East to come there to study. Augustine grew up there. He was like some most preachers' kids. Preachers' kids have a tendency to want to prove that they're tough hombres. And so they get, you know, out of hand. And uh, Alice Kay's kids were that way too. And, but anyway, he, he, Augustine had a godly mother. Her name was Monica. And she prayed for him all the time because she just couldn't do anything. He was chasing women. He was drinking. He had illegitimate children. He was just wild enough to shoot at. When he was converted, later on in life, he looked back over his life, and he wrote a book about his pre-Christian life as well as after he was saved. And he entitled it Confessions. I've got a copy. It's juicy reading. He's really honest about it. And yet God used him to be probably the most influential theologian, especially from the, from the say, 14, around 1500 on up till now. Why? How, how did that happen? His theology affected more people during the Reformation than anybody else. John Calvin, was the French, he was a Frenchman who was an Augustinian monk. He was the founder of what is... Of, here in the U.S. would be the Presbyterian Church because a guy from Scotland goes over and studies under him, comes back to Scotland, starts the Presbyterian Church.
The fellow who founded the Lutheran church, Martin Luther, guess what? Was an Augustinian monk. And they were the strongest influences in the Reformation movement and still are because the biggest struggle that exists between Bible-believing Christians is how much is predestined and how much isn't. And they fight over that. Some things in the New Testament are predestined. Just read the first chapter. It's predestined that Jesus is coming again. It's predestined that a lost person is going to go to hell. It's predestined that a saved person is going to go to heaven. There are some things the Bible says are predestined. But there are some things that aren't. And in my, now I'm getting into my opinion, which of course is the right one. See, the only person who can put controls on God is God himself. And in order to give us free will so that we can choose to love him, choose to obey him, is he had to say, I'll, I will control my authority so that you can choose to love me because above all other things, God wants us to love him because if we truly love him, we'll obey his commandments. So the Bible says. And so it's my belief that that some things are predestined and some things we still have free will to choose. And uh, when you get to heaven, God will say, I'm glad you listened to Scott because he got that right. And at least I hope that turns out that way. There were others that I could mention, but Augustine, I think, I, I think I can prove this, had the most repeated prayer in all of Christendom other than those that Jesus prayed himself. Now remember, I told you, he was wild enough to shoot at. And when he came to Christ, he prayed this prayer. Because you remember, he was uh, chasing women. He had all kinds of girlfriends, you know. And he said, Lord, please take this lust for women away from me. But not right now. That was his prayer, but not right now. I think that's funny, but I, obviously you don't, but that's your problem, you know. That was, that was who we call St. Augustine. Now, how does that affect us? What can we learn out of this? David prayed, Lord, Create within me a new heart. Create within me a new heart. What was he talking about? We said the heart really refers not to the pump in your chest, but he was talking about the person he really is, not just the person you see, but inside. The one that has evil thoughts as well as good thoughts. The ones that, you know, who I really am needs to be cleansed. We are talking about, first of all, the intellect. We're talking about the emotions because, you know, and then we're talking about the conscience. You see, David's conscience took a walk after he had lusted for a while after this young pretty woman. And then the last one is a will. We need to get to the place where our prayer is, Lord, not my will, but thine be done in my life. That's the way Jesus said it. That's the way we should go. And so we, we at times, and see, now David prayed this as a man of God. Why did God find, why did God see such, cast such favor on David? You know, with all of his flaws, the one thing he never failed at, he never sought after other gods. He stayed faithful to the true and the living God all the days of his life. And the struggle then was, which God do I serve? Now, that's not our struggle. Our struggle is, do I obey because I love him, the God we know to be the true and the living God? That's our struggle. And get to the place where just the life that we live 
on a daily basis is a recommendation to the rest of the world who our God really is. We are to be, the Bible says, living epistles. That means letters. Living letters to be read of men. You and I are to be that. They can read us. And when they see us, they should say, if that's who God is, I'd like to get to know Him. And so our prayer should be that of David. Create within me a pure heart, O God, so that my conscience will work. See, here's the deal. I've tried to teach you through the years. You can't carry this Bible with you all of the time. You can't do it. If you're a carpenter, you can't carry a, a hammer in one hand and a Bible in another. You can't do that. So how do you do it? You study the scriptures and start memorizing little passages here and there. The Bible says you hide God's word in your heart. And then what happens? Your conscience then uses the word of God to keep you out of trouble. One old preacher used to say it works like a magic ring. The magic ring said every time I sin, it tightens on my finger. And I become aware, whoops. Your conscience is to work like that. But you have to educate your conscience with the Word of God. And then you live by your conscience. It's that simple. You educate. That's the reason the Bible says study to show yourself approved unto God a workman that needs not to be ashamed, right to handling the Word of truth. You use the Bible. Get it in your intellect. It's a part of the heart. Educate your conscience so that it can squeeze you when you're tempted. And we all are tempted. And that principle, as we grow through the years and as we learn more of God's Word and we hide it in our heart and the conscience works and our will is to please God, the result is people will actually see Christ in you which is, after all, your hope of glory. Without Him in your heart, you ain't going to see glory. He's our hope of glory. So I hope you kind of join with me in saying, Lord, every day for the next week, when I wake up, write it on a little pad by your bed, do whatever, to remind you I want to live this day to please my God. That admits the fact that we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That admits the fact, like the old gray mare, though we ain't what we used to be, we're making some headway. It is the beginning of the transformation of our world. And it should begin with us. So let's pray. Father, I thank you so much that you hear and answer our plea for a new heart. So we think your thoughts. We obey your will. And we seek to please you in all that we say and do. Help us, O oh God, as we sincerely attempt to show the world who you are through the life that we live. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You're free to go. Christ Community meets on Saturday at 5 p.m. and Sunday at 10.30 a.m. For more information, visit www.christcommunity.net or check out our Facebook page.